Uh, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, porn, m m probably Native American, I think, most likely. Right. right. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to all of you joining us. Today I see people are uh, coming in and finding their places at the tables. Uh, once again, I'll encourage you uh, to find a table that you may not know the people at the table uh, so that uh, there would be an opportunity for uh, networking. Um, I'm just going to take uh, some, uh, uh, just a few minutes and uh, give you an orientation of the platform on a ribbon you should be able to see things like attendees where you will find all the people who are attending right now you should be able to uh, chat with people by clicking on the chat button uh, during a live session you can ask questions and once someone asks a question you can upvote that question uh, and that way our speaker would know which question uh, is uh, requested by most people. You can also raise your hand, and if you raise your hand, I can bring you over here uh, at the front stage, and we can have a conversation like that. Uh, you can also find people and by looking at the attendees list, and if you click on the three dots, uh, you will be able to send them a direct message as well. Uh, you must have seen that the tables have disappeared, but don't worry. Once we go into our table discussions, the tables will uh, reappear and you will find those who are sitting around you uh, and you'll be able to have a video interaction with them at that time. All right. So uh, for today, I have requested the Reverend Ann Perot. Uh, to um, bless us and start us off in prayer. So, okay. let me thank you. Holy God, thank you for every seat that will be filled here this evening, for each mind and heart that fills the presence of this room. We thank you. Please open our hearts and our minds to what you would be telling us and lead us in good, rich, prayerful conversations as we learn and partake of things we do not know. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. So, um, and if you don't mind, Anne, I'm going to send you back to the table. Sure. Yes, thank you. All right. Okay. So uh, our speaker for tonight is the uh, co-author of the book we are using as the foundation for this global mission engagement. Uh, and he is the Reverend Dr. Titus Pressler, also the uh, chair of uh, GEM, Global Episcopal uh, mission network <clears throat> and he uh, among other things among many other things uh, he was born in or, or raised in India and in my conversations with him I discovered that his parents uh, just may have taught my parents when they were in uh, in seminary and I point that out because uh, today I think uh, when he talks about the blessing, uh, it's truly a blessing to be uh, networked like that across generations. And uh, we say it's a small world. Yes, it is. Uh, but it's also a blessing of being networked like that in the body of Christ. So. Uh, for me, I think that's the greatest blessing. And so for my introduction of the Reverend Dr. Titus Pressler, I would say uh, his claim to fame today is that his parents taught my parents. 
How's that? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Titus, for being here and uh, really giving us, first of all, that book that we uh, can build um, this global mission engagement with and uh, for being here tonight to lead us in this very important conversation. So thank you. Am I on? Yes. Okay. Well, good evening to all of you. It's wonderful to see you here again. Uh, I've attended a few of these sessions before I was not present last week, but it's just great to see you all. And I'm just so delighted in your commitment to Global Mission and to your commitment to growing in your, in your, in your, in, in the depth of your knowledge and, and your reflection on God's global mission. And I'm honored to be one of the presenters in this series. So it's just delightful to be here. Bless is tonight's theme from the way of love. Bless, which is to say, according to the way of love as explicated by the presiding bishop and others in the Episcopal Church, share faith, unselfishly give and serve. Share faith, unselfishly give and serve. Giving is indeed prominent in mission. And you'll recall that in chapter five of Questing, The Way of Love and Global Mission, it opens with a story from ERD about the work of an indigenous Philippine network in response to a typhoon in that country. And you'll also recall that the Bible study for this session on Bless was the collection for the relief of the believers in Judea from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. So with the background of that Philippine typhoon story and the background of the story from Acts of the collection for the people in Judea, I want to share with you two stories from my own experience, one from Zimbabwe and one from Pakistan. Jane, and my wife, Jane, my wife and I served in Zimbabwe in the aftermath of the liberation war that brought black majority rule to Zimbabwe. And that was a war in which 30,000 people had been killed. So there was just wounds all over the place and, and psychic wounds, people yearning for healing and, and at the same time deeply traumatized. At Bondo, where we were stationed in the highlands of eastern Zimbabwe at about 5,000 feet. I was responsible for about 12 congregations in the Bonda Church District. One of those congregations was the Congregation of St. Gabriel's in Chirarwe, Chirarwe. And they had built their church before the liberation struggle. And then their church had been used by the Rhodesia Front for a period during the war. So when those troops left, the guerrillas came and forced the villagers to destroy their church so that it could not be used as housing for Rhodesia Front troops again. And so the villagers had to, had, had to destroy their church and their school. So now they wanted to rebuild their church. And I recall just being in the rubble of that church on an Ash Wednesday and all the people kneeling outside to receive ashes and the ashes blowing all over the place. Those people at St. Gabriel's Chirarwe, they raised their own money to rebuild their church. They were not seeking outside help and they raised enough money. These were peasant villagers, farmers. The only thing they sought help from the church district was for supplying a roof. Other than that, the windows, the doors, the, the, the concrete, the bricks, everything, they had secured themselves. And I vividly remember the glorious dedication of the new church. And their example of self-reliance was so, so much a blessing for me. In contrast, there was another congregation in the church district, St. Teresa's in Vumba, Vumba, B-V-U-M-B-A, a larger congregation, more affluent. Their church had been built with money from England many decades before. And it had 
sustained damage during the liberation struggle. You could still see the bullet holes in the walls and part of the roof was missing. And they wanted outside help to rebuild it. They were not lifting a finger to rebuild their own church. And so neither did I. A spirit of dependence had been fostered. And so they were simply not willing to take responsibility for their own church building and their, and their own church life. So there's a contrast in a, in, a, in a particular part of the majority world and two different attitudes towards giving and receiving. And for me, it was very clear that the blessing was with St. Gabriel's Chirarwe, not with St. Teresa's Vumba. I faithfully ministered with both congregations, but there was a definitely different spirit between the two. Much more recently, during my time in Pakistan, where I was in Peshawar, right there on the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass in the province of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa during the last decade, <clears throat> not the current decade that's just begun, but uh, I was there from 2011 to 2015. And it was during the war in Afghanistan. And so that war was very near across the border. And meanwhile, the Taliban were very, very active. The, the the, the Afghan Taliban, obviously in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan, the Pakistani Taliban. And Peshawar was the capital of the Pakistani Taliban. And so Peshawar was the capital of bombings and beheadings. The local hospital there in Peshawar had the largest emergency room in the world to give you a sense of just the scale of violence. I was there to help the persecuted Christian community of Pakistan, and also to help build up the church's higher education sector, sector because I was principal of Edwards College, an undergraduate institution, uh, the oldest and perhaps most prestigious in, in that part of the country. Then in April 2013, there was the bombing at the Boston Marathon in Boston that killed three people and injured hundreds. And you may recall that about 17 people lost limbs in that bombing. And it was world news and it was news in Pakistan as well. A couple of days after the bombing, I received an unexpected visit. The archdeacon of the diocese wanted to visit me with a leading woman minister in in the in the diocese and two clergy one of the clergy was from all saints church in peshawar which later that year experienced that terrible bombing where over 120 people were were killed and many hundreds more wounded and injured they wanted to visit me after the boston marathon bombing and i didn't know why they were coming they came and we sat out in the garden of the principal's bungalow and there was tea and conversation. And then they came to the point of their errand. They wanted to express condolence to me as a US American and to pray with me in the traumatic aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombing. And I was amazed because the Boston Marathon bombing severe as it was, was a bombing that in the life of Kaiput Pakhtunkhwa province and Peshawar was relatively routine. But they knew the impact that it had on the United States. They knew the impact that it might have on me because they knew that I had spent a lot of my ministry, not in Boston, but in Cambridge, right next to Boston. And so they wanted to be with me, to express solidarity, to pray with me, and to offer condolence. And that was a blessing. So in going to Zimbabwe, I was giving. And in that, in that experience with St. Gabriel's Chirarwe, I experienced 
they're receiving God's blessing in their own generosity, in their own commitment to their church. And their example blessed me. In going to Peshawar, of course, I was giving again of myself. But there in that garden tea time with those leaders from the diocese, I felt blessed. And I was deeply touched and blessed by their prayers, by their condolence, by their solidarity with me. That concludes my two stories. I offer to you three questions for you to discuss in your table groups. How has your mission work, how has your mission giving blessed others? How has your mission giving blessed others? You're doubtless aware of that and don't be shy about that. I'm sure you're aware of how you have been blessed, how you have been blessing others in your mission. Secondly, how have you been blessed by others in your mission work? How have you been blessed by those to whom you went? How have they given to you in that blessed mixture of giving and receiving? So first, how is your mission how is your mission giving blessed others? Secondly, how have you been blessed by others in mission? And third, what issues about giving are raised for you by the Bible passage in the blessed chapter of questing? And just to recall that to you, it's Acts 11, 27 to 30. It's in the text of the book. It's the story about the collection that was taken for the believers who were in distress in Judea. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, the text for Acts 11, uh, 27 to 30 is in the chat now. And also the three questions are now available in the chat itself. Uh, so now we're going to take a break from this session. And we will be back here by 7 15 7 15 we are going to come back here and uh, i will actually uh, through this chat i will uh, offer a two minute uh, you know uh, warning if you, <laughs> before we come uh, back together so let's take a break and reflect on these questions along with the passage from Acts chapter 11, 27 to 30. Thank you so much, Reverend Titus Pressler. Welcome back. And uh, I know for my table, it was uh, quite a fun conversation we were having. And we really didn't want uh, to leave that conversation. But we are mindful of our time together. Uh, so at, at this point, we're going to uh, go back to our uh, speaker and uh, for our next session. So over to you, Titus. Thank you very much, Amjad. The title of this didactic, which is what Amjad is calling it, a teaching, is the poverty captivity of the churches. The poverty captivity of the churches. As we say in the questing chapter on bliss, ever since the collection for the believers in Judea, money has been intertwined with mission. We go on to say, generosity modeled on the self-giving love of Jesus is a central Christian practice. Poverty alleviation and economic justice are clear mandates in the Bible. The Torah provides for the Jubilee year when land was to be returned, slaves were to be freed, and debts were to be forgiven. As we heard this past Sunday, the prophet Amos, this is in track two of the Revised Common Lectionary, the prophet Amos condemned oppression of the poor and called for God's justice to roll down like a mighty torrent and like an ever-flowing stream. 
Jesus identified strongly with the poor and told his followers that as they fed the hungry and visited the imprisoned, they were visiting and feeding himself. James in his letter calls for generous sharing within the Christian community. All this is about blessing, the blessing of giving. What I want to offer tonight though is a caution about what I call the poverty captivity of mission in the churches today. For many people in the Episcopal Church and in other North American churches, mission itself means that the relatively affluent are reaching out to the relatively poor, whether in their own communities, elsewhere in our country, or to societies and cultures in other parts of the world. If they're not doing something for the poor, it's not mission. If they are reaching the poor in some way, then they are on mission. Christians speak of reaching out to the needy, the marginalized, and those more fortunate than ourselves, all of this in quotes. Today, many short-term teams undertake projects like painting a school or building a home. Other teams conduct medical clinics, drill wells, or undertake other projects that build infrastructure. Longer-term missionaries contribute in education, healthcare, agriculture, and economics. Some emphases are more justice-oriented, such as land reform, rights of women and children, due process for stranded migrants, and liberation from human trafficking. Yet whether it's Band-Aid mission, so-called development mission, or justice mission, a common understanding is that mission means reaching out to those whose socioeconomic conditions are poorer than our own. Now, when mission is defined that way, we should not be surprised that many missionaries see themselves as the givers and the missionized as the receivers. Receivers of the giver's skills, expertise, money, and social capital. Often the attitudes of superiority and assumptions of resourcefulness underlying so-called development mission, including sustainable development, are hard to separate from the assumptions that underlay missionaries' vision of so-called civilizing mission during the colonial period. Missionaries who claim to be so much better than their benighted colonial mission forebears sometimes repeat in three weeks the well-known colonial mistakes of the last 300 years. We become not a blessing, but a neo-colonial curse. So let's look again at the Bible. The poor were not only, the poor were not Jesus' only concern. Think of the well-resourced people the gospel records him reaching out to. Zacchaeus, Matthew, and other tax collectors. Simon the Pharisee, the household of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, the affluent women of Galilee who provided for him, the Roman centurion whose servant he healed, Jairus, the synagogue patron, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, both of whom were members of the Sanhedrin. So Jesus had major concern with people who were more affluent than himself. The socioeconomic diversity of early Christian communities in the New Testament indicates that such missionaries as Peter, Paul, Priscilla and Aquila and Apollos reached both the poor of the Mediterranean world and their own economic peers in the artisan class. They also reached upward toward the rich and those of high standing and political power. And we read about a number of people like that in the book of Acts. Let's look at mission history before the modern period. During the first 300 years of the Jesus movement, Christian artisans, traders, and soldiers shared the gospel with their socioeconomic peers throughout the Roman Empire. During the medieval period, monk missionaries to other societies bore witness to multiple economic strata, peasants, yes, but also economic elites and royalty. Examples include Augustine with King Ethelbert in Canterbury in the seventh century, Boniface among the Frankish rulers in the eighth century, the translators Cyril, Cyril and Methodius with the King of Moravian in the, Moravia in the ninth century, 
the Jesuit Matteo Ricci in the imperial court of China in the 16th century, and another Jesuit, Roberto de Nobile, among the Hindu Brahmins of South India in the 17th century. So the history highlights just how distinctive the last 400 years in Europe and North America have been in linking mission to programs of socioeconomic beneficence. Underlying that linkage was the economic disparity between the wealth of Europe and North America and the relative poverty of Africa, Asia, and Latin America. At first, evangelism and church planting were foremost, with healthcare, education, and economics emerging as European and North American missionaries saw the needs. And it's true that Western churches, West, that, that Western churches' contributions in these areas were great blessings. That, that cannot be denied. That can't be denied. Although often those blessings were mixed with colonial attitudes and policies. Many think that evangelism and church planting are now the province only of indigenous churches, not missionaries from outside. So what has remained is only socioeconomic uplift. Our captivity to that paradigm is what betrays us into neo-colonial attitudes. So how might we extricate ourselves from this missional cul-de-sac? First, we must challenge ourselves to broaden our intercultural missional outreach to include the middle classes and the affluent in other societies. And not only in the two thirds world, but also in Britain and Western Europe. For example, would your diocese consider undertaking a middle class outreach in Nairobi or London? I'm not at all suggesting that we end our engagement with the poor, for that must be a major missional priority amid the economic disparities of the 21st century. Instead, I'm urging us to add engagement with the educational, professional, and economic middle classes and elites in other societies. Only by forcibly broadening the scope of Western mission initiative, can we break the shackles of what is now a centuries old mentality that assumes that God is calling us mainly to play Lady Bountiful with those who have few resources or none? Obviously this would cost more money, but what does it say about us that we go mainly where exchange rates make mission relatively cheap for us? Second, Broadening our outreach to those socioeconomically parallel with ourselves and above ourselves would force us to engage more deeply the breadth of God's mission than we do when we indulge only our reflex for socioeconomic improvement. In the new and unaccustomed environments of, say, apartment blocks in Tokyo or coffee shops in Berlin, we might find ourselves floundering for a while. We would need to reroute ourselves in our Christian identity, listen deeply to the people around us, and discern more authentically how God might be calling us in mission. Might we be moved to move, work with people around developing ethical and vocational bearings? Might we feel called to work on reconciliation, which is, after all, the ultimate direction of God's mission? Might we experience a renewed call to evangelism, which the Episcopal Church today defines appealingly, by the way, as the, quote, spiritual practice of seeking, naming, and celebrating Jesus' loving presence in other people's lives, and then inviting them to more, unquote. Might we feel called to address isolation and alienation and to work with people to build community? Might we feel called to catalyze creation care more urgently? I don't know. I'm just wondering. What I do know is that the humility and gospel authenticity that such a venture might engender could have a profound effect on our other more customary socioeconomic mission work. Third, there are mission initiatives in the majority world, by that I mean Africa, Asia, and Latin America, from which we can learn about reaching out to multiple economic strata the Indian Missionary Society and the Friends Missionary Prayer Band, isn't that quite a name for a mission society, the Friends Missionary Prayer Band, both based in South India, 
each have close to a thousand missionaries who work with socioeconomic peers elsewhere in India, chiefly in the north. Various African and Korean mission groups may also provide models for mission that are not captive to the wealth poverty paradigm of mission. Fourth and finally, we need to appropriate more fully the emphases on companionship and friendship in mission that have been coming to the fore over the last several decades. A consensus has developed that mission must begin not with analyzing, planning, and providing, but with meeting, listening, and relating. Not doing, but being. Not prescribing, but discovering. Not instructing, but collaborating. Especially striking has been the emphasis on companionship and accompaniment in mission as replacements for partnership in mission, which often emphasize projects pursued on a business model. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, the ELCA, has developed accompaniment most fully as its mod modality of mission, while we Anglicans have stressed the related concept of companionships. Lutherans have companion synods, Anglicans have companion dioceses, Presbyterians have companion presbyteries. That's just how widespread this consensus around companionship and accompaniment has become. A helpful current model for how mission companionship can work in situations of need and suffering is ABCD, Asset-Based Community Development, ABCD. The premise of ABCD is that every needy or disadvantaged community has in fact much of what it needs within itself. Missional outsiders come not to initiate a project, but to help the community to identify its material resources and its gifts of skill and initiative, and then to catalyze the mobilization of those assets. ABCD resolutely rejects the assumption that the outside missioner knows best and has the best. And instead it works with the conviction that the community itself knows best and has the best. The poverty captivity, captivity of mission is stubbornly entrenched in our churches, making us today perhaps even more colonial than the colonials. Mission can be liberated from it only with a radical shift of perspective and initiative. For that, an equally radical humility will be required. So that's the talk that I'd like you to think about. And here are three questions that I ask you to discuss in your table groups. First, in your mission work, are you focused mainly on the poor? Or are you reaching the middle class and the affluent as well? Second, how do you respond to Titus's critique of what he calls the poverty captivity of mission in the churches? And third, how might a multi-class outreach in mission help mission attitudes and approaches in your congregation, your diocese, or other organization? Back to you, Amjad. This was beautiful. Thank you so much. You have given us a lot to think about. Um, and hearing uh, what you had to offer, I am wondering if we can uh, go back to our uh, tables, but then reconvene here at 7.50 and uh, perhaps have some kind of uh, a sharing of what happened at your table, uh, because I'm I'm really expecting some uh, wonderful conversations at your table um, with these questions. Well, maybe um, some pushback. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, so why don't we do that? Why don't we uh, go back to our tables and at seven fifty we'll reconvene and at that time from your tables just uh, take note of that uh, ask someone who would be or more than one person and uh, if you raise your hand at that time i will bring you up here and you can share what happened at your table all right so thank you again uh, 
Reverend Titus, and we are going to go back to our tables now. So uh, welcome back to our session. And uh, this is the time where we can uh, regroup and um, uh, share what happened at our tables. So uh, if you would like to share, uh, please do raise your hand. Uh, there's a button that says raise hand. And, uh, and once you do that, I will see uh, your name and I'll be able to bring you uh to this stage all right we have a raised hand all right so uh you can we have father tom coming in yeah, yeah so in our group we we talked about the whole thing of um uh collaborating with uh peers rather or upper levels of society versus lower levels of society. And each one of us at our table in our various missions agreed that we, when we're there, the teams with whom we work and partner are the upper echelons of that society, the, the, the more highly educated people, the, the connected people, the powerful people. And uh, we all agreed each of us doing very different things in different places, that our missions would be a total disaster if it just depended on us because <laughs> they have the knowledge and the connections and the human infrastructure to accomplish what we're trying to do. And then in each of our cases, the recipients, uh, whether in one case of uh, drinking, you know, clean drinking water and another case of computers for educational purposes, and in another case, medical clinics, the recipients were people lower down on the, on the uh, you know, socioeconomic ladder, but that the, the collaboration was at the upper levels, and, and that was the key to succeeding. The second thing we uh, all agreed upon was that we all, that successful or getting things done, you know, way that makes sense to the the host country and host collaborators or partners requires a lot of listening and not a lot of telling you know that we we've all learned that one way or the other that when we learn to l listen to our host and listen to the, their knowledge of the local culture and and what they think is going to work and and doing it in a way that they think is going to produce results, the results are much better than than the other way around. So we've all kind of learned that over the years, you know. That's, that was, that's, all, that's all from our table. That's, that's really interesting, Father Tom, because you have a medical mission that you take. So it's all doctors and, and that, you know, class that you are working with, you know. Yeah, and the ones over there are doctors and lab scientists and nurses and and uh, businessmen who are leaders in the diocese and all that stuff that make these things happen, you know. So, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who would like to share? Please do raise your hand. And Father Tom, I'm going to send you. Yeah. You're going to send me back. <laughs> right. So would you like to respond to that, uh, uh, Titus? Uh, how, would you, how would you think about that? I think that's a very good point. And, and I think that would be true of many mission initiatives that are, you know, where the, where the effort is to do something with or for the poor the people with whom folks are working with, the actual collaborators are perhaps more in, in the middle class. I guess, and, and, I, and I appreciate that point, and I think that's, 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 that's a very important 
point, and it's also uh, in encouraging vis-a-vis -vis the theme that I was setting forth. At the same time, I I wonder about you know here here are indigenous elites, if you will, with mission elites collaborating on mission to the poor, and there's a way in which I still want to encourage us to to consider the possibility, contemplate the possibilities, ponder the possibilities of, of mission initiatives directly to the middle classes, to the affluent in other societies. Again, I feel that, that as we, if we were to undertake that more seriously, it would engender much greater humility in how we approach everything else that we do in mission. Because we would find ourselves not as the resourceful people, not as the experts, but as, as folks who have the gospel that we're offering to, to people who may be, who are peers and who may be above us in, 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 in class structure. Yeah. So if I may uh, share a little bit of my story here. Um, so in 1995, when I went back to Pakistan after uh, studying in this country, uh, I actually wrestled a lot with this question. That's why I'm finding today really, really uh, wonderful. Um, I, I wrestled with it because my parents' ministry really was uh, uplifting the poor, uh, whether it was the slum areas, whether it was the uh, um, uh, farmers, you know. Uh, so it was really directed towards helping the the uh, have-nots. Um, and as a child, I witnessed all of that, and I obviously had great admiration for what they were doing. But I always questioned one thing, that uh, what change be uh, would change be easier and more uh, quicker if the people in power, if their attitudes towards, you know, uh, life and, and, and the world could somehow be changed and transformed. So, so with that in mind, I started working with uh, children of the elite. And, and, and it was all Muslims, and, and I started a school with them. Uh, and, uh, and always wondering exactly the question that uh, Reverend Titus has brought to us today. Uh, like, what would it look like if the elites were transformed? And I say that because uh, Reverend Titus was sharing with me earlier uh, when we, uh, before this session, uh, uh, that he had received some news from Pakistan about uh, an institution where he had spent some time uh, and and was feeling that you know the uh, the the matter is not being resolved, uh, and it's very interesting that. Uh, not perhaps now and perhaps not in the next uh, uh, few years and decades from now, but till very recently, uh, all of the political elite were educated in Christian schools mm -hmm. in Pakistan. Okay. Uh, and so the question that I always asked of the church in Pakistan was, uh, what kind of work have has the church done with them that they are the way they are with you know Christians in Pakistan? So, so the 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 this is a very interesting thing that how do we work with the elite and is transformation possible? Uh, and what would the world look like if those with power? Uh, were infused with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and so two models, 
one that I think my parents lived into, one that I tried to live into, uh, and I don't know which one is right. But I think uh, what you have done today uh, is really given us uh, the reason to think about these two models and to think about how does the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, proceed in the world uh, if we neglect one for the other. So thank you so much for today. And, uh, and we hope to have you here uh, with us in the coming sessions as well. Uh, and, uh, and to all of those who participated today, uh, also a huge thank you. And uh, we will meet again next week at the same time, 6.30. Uh, and at that time, we have uh, two wonderful uh, speakers lined up to lead us, uh, one of which is actually uh, the uh, a, a bishop from uh, Africa originally and uh, Nigeria, and uh, now uh, based in England, and we'll do more of the introduction then. But uh, I look forward to having you all here next week as well. Thank you, and good evening, and take care of yourselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right.